There are things of which I may not speak. There are dreams that cannot die. There are thoughts that make the strong heart weak and bring a pallor into the cheek and a mist before the eye. Astounding. It was actually, it was beyond belief. These were first and only drafts of music. But they showed no corrections of any kind. Not one. He had simply written down music already finished in his head. Page after page of it, as if he were just taking dictation. I would hope so, yes, but time is the thing. Time is, is the essential piece of uh, interpretation. You cannot start without me. See, I start the clock. And we start the discussion. I'm George from Austria. I'm Bia from Portugal. And sadly, it's only the two of us today. If everything goes well, Crit will be back by the next episode. But till then, you're listening to Two Euros Per Movie. Today we are discussing Tar, In the Bedroom and Amadeus. Let's start off with Tar. To give a quick view of my thoughts before we get to spoilers, which I assume will be soon, this is truly an enigma of a movie. It has so many sides to it. It couldn't be broken down in a few words. It does exceptionally well in pretty much any regards I could think of. It is fascinating. It is well written. It has some interesting blocking, some fantastic cinematography. The acting is stellar. I can praise this movie basically all day long. And it still wouldn't really give any rough outline of what this movie really is. I agree completely. The movie is clean. It's beautiful. It has some of the best composition shots that I've seen in the latest years. It also has what I see as a very good start for someone who's not really keen on classical music and or doesn't even really understand what what classical music is all about you know the world of you know orchestra and concertos and all of that it is also able to speak on very serious topics in a very i wouldn't say thriller like way but it almost is a thriller right very enigmatic it's a movie that you cannot figure out completely on a first watch it takes maybe two or three three watches to fully digest what you're what you're watching mm -hmm. it was my third for me actually already damn i swallowed this movie up i still feel like there's way more to unpack than i could have stumbled upon with this watch i i am not really sure if this is actually a movie that you can fully solve i feel like the movie itself is very specific about the things it explains and does not in order to always keep a little vagueness to it. Yeah, it's very mm. open to discussion as well. There's a line in the movie where they say that the listener is more entertained by the question than by the answer. So mm -hmm. I think that in the way that can be extrapolated into the into the movie, as in, you know, raising questions about should we separate the artist from the art? Raising questions about power dynamics and the way they're played out in the various industries that, that exist in our world. Those questions are put out there. And I think that the movie gives us some answers, but not definite answers. I think it's mm -hmm. a really high point for the movie, yeah. The way it portrays and tackles these answers feels almost as if the movie had taken a step back and more looked at the way things are than really trying to find a solution or to give an mm -hmm. answer of what is right or wrong. It just feels incredibly real the way it was made. 
I think that's also a really fun thing to bring up, which isn't spoilerific so far. After the Khan premiere, apparently <laughs> the amount of Google searches for Lydia Tarr uh, <laughs> Wikipedia spiked because people just still thought that that's to a degree a real person. Yeah. But yeah. It, that just says a lot about the very natural way Todd Field wrote this entire movie. Yeah. It's very biographic. I don't say biographical, but it seems like a biopic, right? Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. It Which almost like sounds like person. an insult again. I'm I'm doing it's so difficult to me to really explain this movie because I feel like any label you could attach to the movie is is almost like an insult towards the movie itself. I heard things like musical drama and I'm like, yeah, that's like it doesn't really? seem enough. Right? <laughs> yeah. And like it and it feels like... like a made up biopic, but it also that's not enough. It's also uh, as you mentioned, it's tackling things like cancel culture and topics like these, but it's not really a cancel culture movie either. It's, it's, it's trying so many more things and it's succeeding at all of them. It's not worthy to put one of those labels on it because it's all of them at once. All of them at once. Yes, that's what I was going to say. I think that saying that it looks like a biopic i think it's a compliment because just like says that the character is so complex and the character feels so real that it could be a real a real mm -hmm. person you know a real conductor that we're talking about here but it is not yeah i think that's just kudos to todd uh for todd you know my pal todd <laughs> <laughs> good old todd <laughs> good old todd um yeah but congrats uh for making something that you know makes people wonder if this character is real or not do we want to go into spoiler land i think so spoiler land it is so credits at, <laughs> at the start right yep roll the end credits roll the end credits at the beginning mm -hmm. instantly honoring in a similar way to how we brought up in burning cinematography credit at the beginning of the movie this movie just straight up is like yep all those people made this movie so mm -hmm. let's honor them first and then get to it <laughs> yeah and i think it's also you know how the movie talks about people that are at the top and the people that are trying to get to the top you know and we we first see like all the behind the scenes like the people that you know are responsible for sound responsible for costumes and production and only then we see the big names right like mm -hmm. i think that's an important feature to to have on your credits that's one thing i want to get into deeper a little bit later on when we go to more of the themes of the movie but one big thing that i realized this time around is that there's a lot of parallels that can be drawn between the work of the conductor and the work of a director at a movie set. Mm -hmm. She has that one line where she says, conducting isn't a democracy. A democracy, yeah. Establishing very early on in the movie that indeed the conductor at the orchestra is the person, the last one to make any creative decision, basically, throughout the whole process, similarly to how the, the director would be. And the movie to a degree showcases how some people can only succeed on the shoulders of others and by the movie credits at the very beginning showcasing all of the people that got Todd Field and Kate Blanchett to basically the success of this movie is kind of representing mm -hmm. that in a in a meta way as well yeah going into the movie how much were you into the classical music world? Actively not at all. Mm -hmm. The only Austrian radio channel I listen to is a smaller channel focusing on independent music. But if I wouldn't have that, I would probably rather listen to the classical channel than whatever is, is playing in the charts, you know. I have listened to some of it at some points and I enjoy it. It is just nothing that I really ever 
really looked into before. Yeah, um, I ask because I'm not really experienced in the classical music music world. I'm very interested. I would consider myself a baby in terms of what I know <laughs> and you know uh, the composers and conductors. And it was interesting for me to see some themes being played out and talked about in the movie, especially Mahler, especially Symphony 5. <laughs> it was just very interesting to see from the standpoint of someone that knows a little bit about the classical names that were men mentioned. And I was just wondering, like, how would someone that doesn't really get classical music or doesn't really have an, any interest in uh, how does that person uh, see the movie? Because the movie does spit a lot of references about, mm -hmm. you know, conductors and composers um, and pieces. So I was just wondering how you felt, like, uh, if you felt confused or... Um... Yeah, this relates actually to something that I also said in the last episode when uh, in regarding to Double Indemnity, where... To me, whenever a person is really passionate about anything and they can express themselves well, then it's always fascinating to listen to them. So the beginning of the movie, Tar, embodies the whole idea behind that better than any other recent movie, I feel like. A lot of the things said in that early interview definitely went over my head. I didn't get any references. Most of the lingo felt alien to me. But it was really fascinating and still within that talk, I feel like even as a person who is completely looking at this from the outside, I got a greater understanding of what a conductor actually does. That mm -hmm. one sentence really resonated with me where she said something along the lines of the orchestra plays the instruments, I play the orchestra. And that little line just made all the sense to me suddenly yeah keeping the time out time mm -hmm. it's not a small thing yeah and especially a very good line that also comes by later uh, it gains an, not a new meaning but a new perspective she says you can't start without me right mm -hmm. yeah about this in intro sequence at the the interview Mm -hmm. There's also little things happening just surrounding the whole presentation. I wrote down this moment when we see her assistant for basically the very first time. We see the close-up of her and she is lip-syncing the, the introduction of the yeah of the interviewer that he gives about the summary of the life of Lydia Tarr and her great achievements and how she can lip-sync the whole thing along instantly giving us two major informations right there just by that little visual first of all it gives us the information that Lydia Tarr is definitely someone who tries her best to keep control over everything said about her mm -hmm. she had that whole thing written out or had someone do it for her and she controlled all of that and the second thing we get to know is that this assistant character that becomes a bigger important part of the story later on is not only deeply involved with Lydia Tarr but obsessed to a degree that by far exceeds the usual expectations of a assistant to boss dynamic and that all just happened as a side note within five seconds at the beginning of the movie yeah and there was an interesting detail that I couldn't uh, fully understand because Lydia did, you know, construct this identity in a way, right? Mm -hmm. um, and I think she's like about to go into stage and she flinches a little bit while listening to the, 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 all of the accomplishments that she, that she had and mm -hmm. that she made. I feel like the flinching is part of the act where she expects the interviewer to point it out, which he does. And... Uh, which leads to leads on to maybe a false humble side of her where it might imply that she 
she, she doesn't want to speak too highly of herself or doesn't like when when people praise her too much to give like a false sense of humility around her character maybe uh, she said something interesting as well during that interview when the um, the interviewer was praising her for being a female conductor of such renown and mm -hmm. she said something along the lines of back then when gender was spectacle you know back in the 60s 50s when there was conductors female conductors that were conducting big orchestras they mm -hmm. wouldn't even be the main conductors they would be the guest conductors and she uses a very she says that she's it's not very glamorous right mm -hmm. so she herself in a way she's aware of all this history but she doesn't want at the same time to attach herself to this idea of being a woman in an industry right she says oh, yeah. we are not going to use maestras uh, instead of maestro she's trying to detach herself from her identity in a way she wants to you know people to see her for the conductor that she is and not for a female conductor at the same time it could also hint a bit towards her ambiguity surrounding the whole cancel culture topic and that there's maybe lurking more behind the shadows that she doesn't want to be the face of any of any movement against mm -hmm. that yeah she's obsessed with her image and she's proud as well you know later in the movie we see her collecting little you know pieces from newspapers and she has an obsession with her image she wants to control it right but at the same time as she said in the in the classroom scene you know mm -hmm. so you know the very um the juliard one take yeah the one take where she or she says you know you need to sublime your ego and your identity you need to strip yourself of what you are in order to make music but at the same time she's aware that the world she's is gonna see her in some way so she's very controlling of her image a public image because she sees that either if she cares or not if the the image is important for her music people will always see her for what she presents to the world right she's aware mm -hmm. of that that's why she's so controlling of it a few things that are also established super early on that also hint at what might happen later is for example the fact that her wife is the first villainist we at this point we don't really suspect any wrongdoing but uh, returning to this movie i really felt like that might be the very first hint of any kind of nepotism going on we don't really have any reason to assume that she might not be good enough to be the first violinist any other way but just the fact that her wife is the most important instrument in the orchestra mm -hmm. already hints at a bit of nepotism going on somewhere yeah a little bit of throwing favors and there's also just this general feeling of her making the people around her nervous there's this moment in during the Juilliard class his leg is shaking the whole time he's getting super nervous but there's also something happening later on when she talks to the i think it is the guest conductor that she's trying to fire sebastian yeah yeah sebastian, and the also. exactly mm -hmm. yeah and he he does the whole time she he has a pen in hand and he clicks with it the moment she comes in and it, it gets more and more throughout the scene so there's again this feeling of her being too powerful to really handle it ne right next to her yeah there was also an interesting uh, moment or two interesting moments in the interview before we go any further um, mm -hmm. into the movie where she's talking about the interpretations how should a piece be inter interpreted now in the present yeah. um they're talking about the intention of Mahler writing the five and that no one really knows what what it was it's kind of a mystery but we know the the context were 
of when it was written. Uh, it was a, a piece that was dedicated to his wife, uh, Alma, and she says that we need to understand the marriage of them two. We could extrapolate this to her marriage, in a way. We need to understand her relationship, not only with Shannon, but with uh, all of the girls and all of the people around her, in order to understand what she's putting out, and in a way what she's not going to put out, you know? Because the relationships are not that good, and uh, it puts her in trouble, and it ends up uh, being uh, the cause of her not being the lead conductor for Mahler's uh, five, or fifth, we should say. The, the interviewer uh, also asks if she has a different interpretation about the way that someone should take music from the past into the present. And she says that in the Amazons, uh, there was a tribe that could only uh, listen to a piece um, or a song if the composer was there. So it's in a way the past and the present are in the same place and uh, they coexist. But uh, she talks about the perspective of Leonard Bernstein that believes in uh, Teshuvah, which goes into the transforming and um, recontext of a piece from the past, you know. He um, mm -hmm. would do stuff as, you know, change tempos and he would play a lot with the way that the composition was written. He would just reshape it in a way. Interpreted from a modern standpoint, where a we modern, yeah. nowadays have more context to how his life might have developed after, yes. uh, after the fifth, and he puts a lot of that context that hadn't happened at that point into how he interprets the fifth itself. Yeah, curiously, Tar takes the stand of reinterpreting Mahler's uh, symphony as not being not a not a symphony about you know the problems that he had problems concerning uh because she composed for him as well you know but he said that can only be one composer in the in the house um and she's not looking to that but she is going to look into young love she's going to choose love it's a theme that we see reoccurring throughout the movie she does choose love throughout the movie um, even if she already has love at home, you know, but she's trying to re-experience the young love that she felt for her wife at the beginning of their relationship in that apartment. And she's trying to, you know, recreate that experience through the many women that come across her in the, the orchestras. Mm -hmm. To get to the big uh, Juilliard sequence, let's get it out of the way. Obviously, it's a fantastic one take. The amount of planning that had to go into that super long sequence with incredibly detailed dialogue that just goes on and on with a lot of different positions to hit the marks for the actors, but also work out the blocking of the whole sequence. So the camera moves just throughout the whole thing it just constantly finds new perspectives of the room and pauses there for a while and whenever it pauses you could just take a screenshot of that and it would be a fantastic scene just on its own if it was staged like that but mm -hmm. the movie just does it in motion basically uh, just pauses for those beautiful moments and finds those beautiful imagery but what I think is the most interesting thing about the whole sequence is what happens in the dialogue and how the characters are written in that scene. So this is the first time where the whole cancel culture comes up in a very direct confrontational way, where the whole topic really gets going. And it doesn't take a stance on either side. The way the student is written is really supposed to be a little obnoxious where the things he says do make sense to a degree but you can still you still feel like that he might you know he he might overdo it I yeah guess. you're just seeing things in in a black and white uh, perspective yeah. instead of looking into the grays right exactly 
uh, Lydia Tarr points out a lot of these flaws in his thinking or these possible problems that come through judging art in that way and how he himself could be judged by that and he would rather probably be judged by his craft than any other circumstances surrounding his life that he might not even be in control over. But at the same time, the movie doesn't stand on the side of Lydia Tarr either during that sequence. We very clearly are aware of the whole thing being overdone from her side as well, where she is supposed to be the teacher in that scene. She's supposed to bring him new perspectives on things, maybe, but she's definitely not supposed to humiliate him in front yeah. of the whole class. She was witty and she, it was fun and interesting to listen to her, but she really overdid the whole charade to a degree that is definitely not acceptable. <laughs> yes, yes, I agree. I think that her perspective was well laid out, but the delivery <laughs> is not it. I think that a classroom should be, you know, a place if, in which you learn and you're exposed, as you said, to, you know, new ideas. But it shouldn't be an unsafe place because by then you would shut your, your brain out, you know, if you're mm -hmm. offended. She was not really approaching it as if she wanted to teach him something. She was almost approaching it as if she wanted to fight him on the topic. Fight him, yeah. Yeah. A little bit preacher as well, like mm -hmm. in a preaching way. I think we might have like similar stances on what, you know, the answer to should we separate the art from the artist? As she says in her own world, can classical music written by assholes exalt us? So what do you think? Because I think that, and recently with the, you know, Mr. <laughs> Kanye West um, mm -hmm. controversial, I think that music should stand on its own. But I think you can always have the context and you can always think about the context and the way you're going to consume that piece of art. Yeah. For example, I don't see myself buying any Kanye West album, you know, I'll probably, you know, listen to it like on the internet, probably, you know, YouTube, mm -hmm. but. You're making the active decision to not support him financially directly. Yeah, but does it really matter, you know? It's not like he needs my my 10 euros to live, you know? He's rich already. Yeah. Uh so what is that what what's the impact, you know? But you can also be understanding towards the music. I think that the world would be very boring if I selected my music towards, you know, the very specific details about someone's life that I, I do not agree with. I think there's always context behind the music, behind the, the art, and then you can decide for each case what you want to do with it. And I think that's that falls on every person um, to, you know, think about that and anal analyze that within themselves. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm I'm pretty much on the same page right there with you. I didn't really have any experiences like that with my personal music taste. I'm not a big Kanye fan, so I, I wasn't really put in front of any moral dilemma if I should buy the next Kanye album, because I wouldn't have either way, to be honest. Mm -hmm. So, But regarding particularly movies, I feel like we're, we're both pretty familiar with the, the ethical dilemmas that come up talking about I don't know, old Polanski movies or Polanski, anything like that. Yeah. yeah. I feel like the discussion becomes even more vague when it comes to movies because all of a sudden you're talking about so many creative people being involved yeah. and making decisions along the way where it isn't really a unique mind's creative force coming through all the way. Yes. And you're kind of punishing a big group of people for the flaws and the mistakes of an individual, which makes it even more difficult. But I definitely agree on the fact that you probably have to go on a 
case by case basis and just make the decision for yourself because at the end of the day if you can enjoy the arts nevertheless and still have the context in mind and maybe think about that a bit i don't think any additional harm was really done yeah if you're consuming the the piece of mm -hmm. art you can also see this from the perspective of consumers people are eager to cancel and if a group of people wants a person to be condemned for their little or big mistakes that they've done they want to extend that view to every single person in the world in the way that you know it's wrong it's morally wrong if you consume this piece of art mm -hmm. in a way we're you know in a notion and there's people left and right ripping uh, rippling waves and you have to mind your own boat and be consciously aware of what you like and where you stand and how does art can impact you and if the identity of the person that made that art is that important to your appreciation of it you know mm -hmm. but tar <laughs> there's a really amazing line early on in the movie as well in that scene when she talks to her daughter's bully mm -hmm. the, yeah. the last thing she says to her is if you tell anybody about this nobody will believe, believe you, you. Yeah. yeah which is just this perfect example of how those patterns form you have the clear power dynamic between the powerful Lydia Tarr in that scene and the weak small child in that scene who has obviously no fame no big voice to talk to the masses and you have a demand and the clear threat that she can't do anything about it it's such a perfect metaphor for the whole thing where I'm kind of surprised that I didn't pick up on it the very first time around because once the story led to those more direct confrontations with the mother, I was still surprised. I didn't see it coming. And this little sentence in the beginning of the movie is already hinting at so much to come. Yeah. And so much about the way that she, you know, deals with people that are smaller less powerful than her mm -hmm. the they won't believe you but at the same time she believes that god watches us all you know <laughs> so <laughs> <laughs> she's setting herself uh, a trap there she also keeps referencing the term robot mm -hmm. in a way that she sees you know people as less and people that are below her they're you know disposable she also likes to reference people that don't have the creative drive or the creative smartness, I would say, mm -hmm. as robots. When Elliot, the um, director of um, Ar Accordion, the, yep. I think it's the foundation she's in, he asks her for her performance score and how did she do it? How did you manage to you do, do this wonderful thing? And she says, free bowing. You know, but there's no glory for a robot. Do your own thing. Then mm -hmm. later, she's talking to the, the guy, Max, in the class. Mm -hmm. He's saying that he's a robot for believing the things that he believes because, you know, he's... Um, he's been programmed in a way. Programmed by social media, you know. Mm -hmm. It seems that she's proud of her identity for being such a free thinker and uh she condemns people that you know are either against her or are following the the flow are going with the flow of other people's ideas mm -hmm. yeah I, I didn't really pick up on it but you're right in the dialogue scene with the foundational guy doesn't she also call the the guest composer she ends up firing later on uh, mm -hmm. robotic yeah i think i think she also says that about his conducting where she means he's emotionless in that case i feel like where he's just like a metronome where you yes. might as well have a metronome standing there standing there yeah mm -hmm. i had forgotten about that one i wanted to talk about something regarding you know the 
her image and the way that she sees herself. Throughout the movie, I don't know if you noticed, but there's so many mirrors, so many reflections. In the first sequence, before the interview, you know, the, the interviewer is talking about her life. And we see she's like practicing the pose for the cover of the symphony, where she's yeah. mimicking, I think it's Claudio Abado. Um, and she's like writing. Mm -hmm. There's like a three piece mirror where a, her image is split. And we see that mirror again when she's alone practicing the piano. I think this, there's like two times where we see her alone and the mirrors are there. So it invokes this, you know, this idea that her image is split, herself is split, you know? How the public sees her and how she sees herself. Herself, uh, yeah, and how people... Totally different. Yeah, people around her see her. Because she had to strip a part of herself, right? Yeah, her name is made up as we found find out by the end of it. By the end. That she's originally called Linda Ta. Linda, yeah. There was like this this little detail that I want to bring bring up about the mirrors. I kept seeing, I was like, oh my God, so many mirrors. <laughs> <laughs> I, I see Tar as a very sensitive character in the way that she keeps herself clean and her surroundings clean, but she also um, is very sensitive to noise and sound. But it's yeah. very selective about that, right? Because she is a conductor, right? Mm -hmm. She is exposed to music and loud volumes of sounds. But when she's alone, every single, like, noise that, you know, wood cranking or the noise from a fridge or just a low hum during the night or a low frequency or a high frequency during the night. The car vibrating while driving. Precisely. She noticed this. She hyper-focuses on this stuff and it seems to bother her. It's like as if she's being haunted by these noises, right? Mm -hmm. um, especially because they come when she's uh, asleep, uh, late at night, um, or when she's alone. Um, there's this idea of being haunted by sound. I want to point out something that mm -hmm. I think I only noticed this time around. I don't remember noticing before. There was always this low volume song playing in the background, like a low hum of a shallow. Uh, did you notice it? No, I didn't. When? Throughout the whole movie? Not throughout the whole movie, but in certain scenes where it seems that it, that there's silence, there's a hum of a, a shallo, like a very low note just playing. Mm. Interesting. No, yeah. I, I, I didn't realize. Yeah, I, I'm going to show you after, but it plays in some um, more quiet parts of the movie, more with more tension as well. Yeah, I just noticed this time around. So she's haunted by these noises, and in a way, we're haunted by them as well. Uh, especially this low hum that was uh, playing some scenes. Very low. You had to be, like, really focused on it to notice. But she's also haunted by one of the girls, right? Uh, by Krista. her ex-student, Krista, yeah. exactly. So Krista keeps sending emails very concerning emails, you know, mm -hmm. desperate even. Do you think at, at the very beginning, the very first seconds of the movie are the, this shot of, uh, of a video call uh, th with like an iPhone or something like that, and you see a chat uh, laid over top of it. Do you think the assistant is talking to Krista at that moment? I don't know if it's a, to Krista. I have some theories about that. I think that's the assistant uh, recording the live and chatting with someone who could, could potentially be Krista, but I also think that it might be the Russian girl, Olga. You think the Russian girl, Olga? Yeah. Oh, so you think that that happens actually later throughout the story when... I think they, they probably... There's like a, a pact made between them that they might be setting her up, in a way. Maybe. I would need to rewatch to to really think about that, but I, I feel like it's, 
it would have been if it was meant to be a specific person i would have thought more of krista in that mm -hmm. moment because it would be the only time where the movie doesn't follow a linear storyline it's we know what we know about these girls uh, olga krista and francesca so mm -hmm. francesca and um krista they were together with tar in the mm -hmm. amazon right and something happened there and they were involved probably sexually romantically mm -hmm. tar talks about an obsession from krista's part but we don't know because she might be lying yeah. you know just playing the victim we know that francesca was also threaded in that relationship in a way now olga comes out of nowhere and she picks the interest of of tar but what's interesting is that the way that she disappears into that abandoned building it's just it seems so shady to me there's an interesting thing i read an article where someone said that that might be the moment where the movie drifts away from reality reality mm -hmm. yeah that in in that in that basement right there where she gets followed by a dog and she hits her head in the most brutal sound design <laughs> i <laughs> it, it's insane <laughs> it, uh, oh man that hurt so much that sound yeah uh, people have People have theorized that from that point on, it might be in her imagination what happens. It might be a mixture of reality and madness. But yeah, that uh, that moment is so shady and so weird and outerworldly that people have theorized that something is something other than just like the, the literal things are happening there. Yeah, mm -hmm. there's also this moment where Francesca and Olga trade uh, gazes uh, when Tar is having that photo shoot for the um, the cover of the the, the album mm -hmm. and Olga looks she's like peeking at them Francesca notices and she gives like a you know a more suspicious or more meaningful look at her in a way, it seemed mm -hmm. like they knew each other or she knew something about that girl. I saw that moment more as of Francesca knowing what's, what awaits Olga. Of mm -hmm. like, she, she saw herself yeah. in that position where she's the young new musician and she's the talent and Tar gives her the feeling that she's something super special, but she knows where this is going to end up at. I didn't feel like it needed to have a, lay a layer where they knew each other. Yeah, maybe, yeah. But it's interesting. I'm, I'm going to look out for that at the next rush. <laughs> Same. Here we go again. <laughs> <laughs> but then we have the strange doodle, right? The little drawing. The labyrinth symbolism. Yeah, the labyrinth, yeah. Mm -hmm. We see in a, in a book first. Yeah, that apparently Krista gave her, right? Yeah, but yeah, it might be. So it's challenged by Vita Sackville West. And I, I researched a little bit about this book, and it talks about a love affair between two women. Vita, the, the writer, she's also known for having an affair with Virginia Woolf, the, the writer. Mm -hmm. we, she has been given this book, right, about a love affair, and it has this weird labyrinth on it and then yeah. we see this labyrinth more times throughout the movie we even see it in uh, the little girl's bedroom petrus she has it on top of her table oh and also francesca has it on on her apartment i think you can also see it when she wakes up to find that metronome that is going mm -hmm. off in the middle of the night yeah, yeah i think it was also there I'm not really sure if it has one clear answer. I feel like the, that the labyrinth represents the movie more as a whole. I feel like it, it more represents her problems going on that we are not aware of, the, the struggles that she's facing that are happening kind of outside of our consciousness, outside of our what we observe of this universe. Mm -hmm. It might be, if at all, 
meant serious and happening in the universe, then it's it might be more uh, meant as like maybe an inside joke she and Krista used to have. Like it's um, it's a way of her communicating directly to Tar in a way that only Tar will understand. I'm not even sure if it's meant to be literally there. Just like I don't believe that um since we're on the Krista topic, uh Krista in those scenes where she wakes up where Tar wakes up at night, you can at least once see Krista sitting there in the dark background. Yeah. Just yeah. for like a split second. And that's after her suicide. I don't feel like the movie tries to imply that she literally is still alive and is a ghost. currently in that room. Mm -hmm. I feel like it's just representing her still being a part of Tar's life, where the fact that she's gone doesn't mean that she's gone of her life and the things that she did to her will live on. And in a similar way, the labyrinth is still like the her inner struggle with that is still living on and reappearing in her life yeah i i do agree so my first thought seeing that labyrinth was i thought of the the jungle and the tribe and the time that is spent there i also thought it was some kind of you know something that they shared there's this also like word game that they do, like where they scramble the the, the letters in a in a word. Mm -hmm. So Tar does that with Krista. I, I think she's Krista Simon, right? Yeah. She scrambles the word. She's like substituting the place and you know the positions of the letters, and we get at risk. Mm -hmm. It's as it's as if she's trying to find meaning in her name, you know, to. Yeah just yeah just on a quick side note people have made that with tar herself because the movie could take place in any art form and people just said yeah tar is just like a representation of art in general art. her mm -hmm. name is is basically that yeah and we also see in francesca's apartment she has a copy of her book and it has tar on tar and then she scrambled the words into rat on rat right <laughs> so we have this little word game between them since you know francesca is also into the joke and then we have the labyrinth so at first i thought it was just a cheeky little thing you know remember me this is like something that we both knew once later during the movie i noticed that you know francesca also had it petra also drew it so the way that I took it is that it was a way of telling us, okay, Lydia Tar is being haunted by her own pattern, you know, her own mess in a way. Mm -hmm. So she has a pattern of just being attracted to young women, being unfaithful in her marriage, even though, you know, uh, Sharon says that she knows and she doesn't care. So she has a pattern of taking an interest a special interest into a young woman and then manipulating the world around her to fit this woman into high places in uh, orchestra or institutions she knows what she does right she's aware mm -hmm. even though she doesn't want to admit it uh, she does play herself as a victim even when she fell in the the abandon, abandoned building she later tells her wife and the orchestra that, you know, uh, I was robbed, I was assaulted. Yeah. <laughs> she doesn't tell people that she literally fell. She was attacked. You know, she prefers to have the story that she's a victim instead of telling, I was following this girl and I fell. Mm -hmm. She's again constructing her legacy. Yeah. So even though she's aware of what she does and playing herself as a victim, she has this little hum just as we the viewer have and she sees these patterns and i don't think they're actually there Pro mm -hmm. they're probably not there especially the in petra's bedroom so she's seeing all these patterns all around and it's in a way your scenes are chasing you they're haunting you 
and there is going to be a time where you're going to be confronted about them and you're going to lose your loved ones and the way you live your life because of the things that you do and the patterns that you constantly keep engaging in, even though you know they're wrong and that you mm -hmm. shouldn't be, be engaging with that type of behaviors. So that's how, how I interpreted the, the whole uh, labyrinth uh, thingy, more as in Interesting. a pattern. I like that. Yeah. Also, just a little note into her personality. She knows her wife needs the pills. Why is she taking the pills? Like <laughs> <laughs> when she leaves uh, for New York to, re to um, do the book presentation, yeah. she takes the, the, the pills again. Yeah, um, Lydia Tarr, actually not that great of a person. <laughs> yeah, um, seems so, it seems so. Yeah, yeah. And the wife knows about that, right? There's an interesting scene, like an interesting detail that I noticed this time around, where Tar is speaking with a, a fan at the end of the, the, the big interview in the beginning. Yeah. And she has like a red bag. Mm -hmm. Later, when she comes home, she has that same red bag amongst her very dark, dark grays and blacks suitcases and clothes. And the wife, she's like taking a breath because she, you know, she was having an attack, I think. Mm -hmm. Because she didn't have the pills. And Tar is like showing her love. And the thing that she notices uh, is she gazes down, the wife, Sharon, she gazes down. And instead of, you know, noticing the caress she sees the bag yeah and she inquires oh new bag suits you but we know it doesn't uh she doesn't <laughs> she's not a, like a, a really really bold with her colors it's an odd item to have and uh shannon notice notices that and just accepts that you know it might be from either someone else or she has like a new influence in her life um, yeah. she wants to impress someone right yeah i think she she instantly picked up on the fact that it has been a gift like we from the story we can assume that francesca gave her that back because she just listened in on the whole conversation she had with that fan in new york yeah probably yeah but yeah the beginning of the end and there's an interesting thing where i looked into the marketing of this movie afterwards and i'm actually a big fan of the marketing not only because, but also because the marketing basically lies the whole time. <laughs> oh no. <laughs> what is it? It, it lies in an I interesting think... way where the trailer has a bunch of shots that don't ever appear in the movie. They are, mm -hmm. It's more of a mood piece. And even the things they show are completely shown out of context. So the moments she storms onto the stage uh, during the fifth performance that's in the trailer, like a few seconds of it. And in the trailer, it feels like she's just a somewhat nervous artist, you know, about to get on stage and have her big moment. And that's yeah. obviously a giant lie. Uh, there's a line in the trailer that her wife says, where she says she's crawling more into herself or disappearing more into herself. And in the movie, she says that about their daughter when in the trailer again mm -hmm. it implies that it's tar we're speaking about so this yeah it's a super interesting creative trailer and it evokes a lot of emotions and ambiguity and intrigue of what the fuck is actually going on but it definitely sells you <laughs> something that i wouldn't even say it sells you something that you don't get in tar i feel like the vibes that trailer gifts across are there in tar but it just as much doesn't sell you the real thing as like i earlier said claiming that it's a you know cancel culture movie mm -hmm. would also sell you the wrong idea but it's so creative and unique that i was just intrigued by it yeah it's, it's interesting yeah yeah interesting marketing um ironically not successful at all so 
uh, studios should probably not take notes from my loving this marketing because it obviously wasn't successful for some weird reason. <laughs> Please do more. Yes. <laughs> I would Mark love my more. I would love more yeah. marketing like that, but then I probably wouldn't get the movies that I love anymore. So maybe don't. <laughs> yeah, just support my my expectations. You mm -hmm. know. Mm -hmm. About the ending, what do you think when she storms on onto stage there? What, what are your thoughts Badass. on that moment? <laughs> Badass. <laughs> <laughs> no, I was... So I was already nervous for her because I was listening to that trumpet, you know? And he was playing mm -hmm. and she was not on stage. Yeah. So I was, you know, I was feeling the, oh my God, I'm late to my own concert fear you know i was i was having that type of anxiety so i knew something was off right there because as she says in the beginning everything starts with her she's the one that you know starts the time and stops the time and they started without her so mm -hmm. that scene was a beautiful outburst it just really showcased how mad and how consumed she was with the problems and the controversy that she was involved in. Um, and how losing everything because of her own mistakes bring, brought her down in a way, right? Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, and she beats Elliot. Uh, I don't know, Elliot, I didn't like Elliot much. So. <laughs> <laughs> it's wrong, don't beat people, especially on the podium, but... <laughs> <laughs> If it's gotta be someone, it could be Elliot, is what you're trying to say. <laughs> yeah. It was an interesting, tragic scene. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And followed up right after that with uh, like a giant subversion, even in the very last shot, the fantastic... <laughs> the fantastic conclusion to the whole thing, which kind of showcases that cancel culture isn't really canceling yeah. anyone yeah it might affect their careers temporarily but it clearly shows that she has a place in this industry still even though it might be an absolutely different place than you would come to expect of a lydia tar yeah and the whole <laughs> Monster Hunter cosplay life recording whatever. <laughs> I don't know. Fantastic. <laughs> I actually don't know how she might feel. She might feel humiliated, right? But I think that even being uh you know in a in a space that it's not her own, she still respects the music. Mm -hmm. And it's the thing that I see throughout the movie, especially there was a scene where, you know, when the Osia, I think it's her name, she was like the first cellist, yeah. I think. Mm -hmm. So she got subverted from the position the, of being, you know, the, the soloist. soloist. Yeah. And even though she got mad, and even though Sharon knows that, you know, Tar has something up her sleeves, while Olga is playing the, the you know, the piece, they are still appreciative of the music. Yeah. It plays into the idea of separating the art from the artist again, mm -hmm. you know? Truly. Um, and I, th I don't even think that if you would have another scene by the end of the movie where someone is interviewing Tar, I don't think she would claim that she lost. I think she would feel like, or she would at least try to make the claim that she's the winner here because she's still doing arts she's still doing the one mm -hmm. thing she's good at she's standing there on stage and she's the one that makes the time start i can kind of agree with that but i think that comes after the period that we see where she's trying to rebuild herself right she goes back to home she plays her own composition for petra in her piano but it's out of tune everything's wrong the mm -hmm. the house is small but then she goes to her room and she listens to young people concert of uh, leonard bernstein mm -hmm. it's the thing that he did in the 60s 50s it seems like she's getting back to her roots what made her love music and she's reminded of what music really stands for because for a while she kind of forgot that music was the main thing. Mm -hmm. Bernstein, he says, uh, 
important thing she says music is always going somewhere and this is when she cries and you know she's emotional about this because she knows where to go now she knows that she she now has to follow the music because music is going somewhere and so is she even though she was you know cancelled and her life is destroyed there's there's a path for it and she's mm -hmm. she's gonna get there and she did get there and she Probably, as you said, if she gets into an interview a few months later, she'll probably be at a place where she will uh, have regained uh, her confidence in her art. Yeah, uh, I wasn't even trying to claim that she doesn't feel devastated on the inside. I feel like she would, to the outside, present herself as someone who wasn't even, you know, faced by, by these things and that she is still fine because she can do what she wants to do which is conduct that yeah. she would try to portray that image of her mm -hmm. there's a theme that comes back by the end when she's in thailand where she has two guides that take her into the jungle and and they're playing the water and she's watching them behind the curtain in that moment, I thought, okay, she's now here witnessing once again what she keeps chasing every time she pursues this woman, and that's young love, right? And now she's like watching that from from the behind the scenes, in a way, behind the waterfall. And in a way, even in Thailand, she's still being haunted by the her mistakes, right? So when she wants a massage. Oh yeah, yeah. She goes into this spa like I don't know if it's really a spa. It might be a spa, it might be something else. I'm not sure. Mm -hmm. But she goes to pick a masseur and they're placed and positioned as if they are an orchestra with the different sections. And she She chooses from it. Yeah. And she very intuitively raises her hand as if she's conducting when she sees these young women yeah i don't know if you notice yeah. she asks should i pick one and she does like a a, a gesture it looks like she's conducting mm -hmm. and where her, her her hand stops and the where she's looking at it's like the the number five right so she says do you want to pick the number five and it's very you know um <laughs> i didn't historical. realize the the number thing but yeah it's definitely that moment where she makes some character progress because she yeah. kind of realizes that that very sexual way in which she has been choosing a masseur right there applies or like mirrors her behavior in the orchestra and she is all of a sudden not fully okay with it anymore because yeah. then we see her throw up in the car just like later on yeah, it's the first emotional, visceral reaction that we see from her pertaining her mistakes, right? Mm -hmm. And it's curious that, so she says that rehearsal is the place of discovery, right? Yeah. And the movie, in a way, it was mostly rehearsal and then the performance is just, you know, where you present whatever was discovered during the, the rehearsal. And for this movie, the rehearsal was, in a way, a group of certain incidents and events that led to the discovery of her own wrongdoings that led to her not being the main conductor of the performance. So the, the final result of that discovery was actually not her being the conductor. And that was interesting. But in Thailand, she rehearses with, with this young people orchestra, and she also takes notes in the street in the middle of all that noise she's taking notations on the music sheet or the performance score and i found it very interesting where she's stripping down a part of herself that is very focused on curating the sounds that are around her mm -hmm. even her hotel it's very you know full of people going around and the changing sheets and the streets are very busy it's a very different place from what she's used to in Germany. And then the ending scene. <laughs> yeah, then the ending scene itself with the beautiful reveal of what type of orchestra and what type of concert that is. Yeah. 
if you put in contrast the beginning of this very serious music <laughs> film and then the ending by <laughs> at which point it's like the within classical music cycles the environment in which she conducts by the end of it might be regarded as maybe <laughs> the lowest kind of circles you could give yourself up to yeah and uh, it's it's just for a movie that takes classical music so serious it's just this phenomenal little twist that it, it comes natural it feels logical that she would end up somewhere like that that a place like that would still have open arms for a world-renowned conductor like her and yet it comes out of nowhere to a degree where I, I was taken by storm. <laughs> it's, yeah. it's such a hilarious way to end it off. It is, but some exceptions. But in general, I don't think that's like such a thing as lower music and, you know, yeah, higher I'm music, not even but... claiming that that's my stance mm -hmm. on it. I'm just saying like in a general way of what you would expect classical music yeah, yeah, to be. Yeah. Yeah. That's probably just it. very prestigious. And, mm -hmm. yeah. But I think that the biggest disrespect here and the biggest humiliation is that she's not or the music is not the main focus so this is like mm -hmm. a movie theater and or in a convention right where people are watching the movie with a live orchestra so the music is not the central piece and she is also wearing headphones you know mm -hmm. um, so there's this just very conflicting factors that in comparison to you know what we norm normally see in uh, classical concerts yeah does that bring us to ratings ratings what's your rating for tardan at a first viewing i gave it an 8 and i think i might bump it to a, a 9 now mm -hmm. so 9 out of 10 at the first viewing i was also at an 8 it grew to a nine, and um, what am I supposed to say? It's gonna be a ten. I I can't Damn. find my way around it. It's a it's such a unique movie, fantastic. Damn. First ten of the T episode. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> first ten of my side, I believe. I in, think in the so. Podcast, yeah. So this brings us to the next movie on the list, which is In the Bedroom. The 2001 directorial debut by Todd Field. What did you think of this beer? It's funny because it doesn't seem like a someone's first uh, feature. Mm -hmm. Truly. It's a very small story, right? I would say it's a small story. Mm -hmm. The number of characters, you know, they're uh, what you expect from a, a drama. But... We have like this main perspective from this father and this mother, and the movie re it's going to revolve around this perspective, and it does it in a very slow paced and also complex way. That's what I appreciate about the movie that it's it was able to touch upon very different types of emotions in a, a very successful way, and it's also very beautiful. It invokes the, the summer vibes, especially during like the night shots. It's, um, it's very comfortable to watch. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Again, I didn't know anything about this movie going into it, other than it being the first movie by Todd Field. Yeah, same. I expected one thing, and what I got was definitely that, but... <laughs> <laughs> Again, um, it it was so much more. It's fascinating to me that the main thing that really connected these two movies for me was how Todd Fields already back then seemed to be an expert at how to set up expectations and successfully subvert them without mm -hmm. really taking away from the things you you led up to in the beginning. So the without going into spoilers yet the first third of the movie is a very different movie than the rest of the movie mm -hmm. yeah for sure and it doesn't take away from the first third 
like the the first third on its own works so flawlessly and explores all these emotions that this kind of story would usually explore and could touch upon it does all of that but it also just then all of a sudden is like and now we're doing something different mm, anyways yeah. <laughs> it's it's fascinating how how you can make those shifts and not lose anything in the process or not make anything feel hollow doing it yeah in a way it felt really close to life you know our life can just like propel you in a very different way from what you first imagined it was going to be like mm -hmm. i think the movie does that very well and it keeps it re really into the you know there's no like big climax scene I would say, or there's not not many, you know, mm -hmm. big outbursts of emotions. There's some, of course, yeah. but the movie keeps it to the routines of the the many characters and the relationships that they have between them, and that was interesting to watch. But it was not really my thing, consistently, I guess. Mm -hmm. That's why I I, I I feel like I don't have a lot to speak on it, but, you know, not every movie has to, has to be a tar or, you know, that <laughs> yeah. needs to be dissected. And, you know, some movies are more straightforward and that's totally fine. Mm -hmm. But yeah. Just on a general filmmaking stance, the beginning is very intriguing from like the very first second. We start off on a black screen. All we hear is sound design. Then we have the first imagery, but we don't see the characters yet. All we see is a wheat field. Then we see f feet running through that wheat field, but still not the characters. And it's more about the laughter the, that we hear, the, mm -hmm. the, the feeling, the emotion exactly uh, that comes yeah. across from that moment that is important before we really get to know the characters. And from that point on, the viewer is always playing catch up with the story. We kind of get thrown into this situation where all the character dynamics are well established. Everyone within that group kind of knows where he's at, but the viewer doesn't. The viewer is, mm -hmm. is just propelled into that and there's no character selling the viewer for them explaining and that's how they met and that's how that happened you know it's, yeah, it's, it's, just... it's just observing like a fly on the wall or a noisy neighbor has enough res <laughs> yeah has enough respect <laughs> uh towards the viewer where he trusts in us figuring out as we go along just by observing how those people interact with, with each other can we go into spoiler yeah, I, I think so yeah spoiler talk okay yeah, going more into spoiler talk, there's like this scene in the beginning with the father where he's basically, he, he talks about the meaning of the title of the movie, right? How three people cannot coexist in the same space, right? He's mm -hmm. talking about the lobsters to this young child and he says, you, you know, like this one lost its head and that's because, you know, there was the cage was too crowded and that's what happened <laughs> in the bedroom so i guess that forecasted a little bit the especially, triangle thing. yeah the yeah. triangle the love triangle that that existed between uh frank natalie and richard yeah mm -hmm. what's curious is that as the lobster lost its head its child is also gonna lose, you know, part of his head is shot in the head. So I thought I thought it was a really interesting uh parallel. Even knowing that, you know, it was telling me something important at the beginning of the movie with that line, I still was very surprised by the scene where, you know, mm -hmm. Frank comes to his demise by the ends of uh Richard, the jealous yeah. husband. Ex husband. I think they were still yeah. married, but um, married. split up. Yeah. I wrote down from the beginning as well that I like that this movie has somewhat of a title card sequence. It's, it's almost this <laughs> lost art form where you have an abstract, only somewhat related to the movie visual part 
of the movie where the credits are rolling. I feel like David Fincher is one of the last people to really hold up that that badge to to hold up that art form. But this movie felt like an updated version on that, where during the beginning credits you can see a fish factory in the works and how that all mm. happens, which is definitely the movie taking a step to the side, but it's still something that happens actually in the universe and is in somewhat related to the work that our protagonist is doing. So I thought that was yeah. a really interesting little updated way to do a modern title card. Yeah, because that was the company called Strout, right? That is the 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 company of the the husband, um, Richard. Oh, is it? I think so. I, I remember like seeing some vans going, like it was a fish company and it had Strout in it. Hmm. And Strout reminds me of Trout. Yeah. <laughs> so I was like, okay, maybe, you know, and their last names was Strout. So, um, Interesting. Yeah, I thought it I didn't, was, that didn't make that connection. About 20 minutes in, we have this conversation between Natalie and her husband Richard. Since, as I already pointed out, we are constantly doing catch up, and the viewer doesn't really know what happened between them before they split up, there's this incredible amount of tension going on throughout that scene where we're just not in the know. Was there, for example, any violence involved between their breakup, you know, to to get to this point? And we are never sure if she is in danger in that very moment. Mm -hmm. It's this incredible thing where he just leaves us to catch up. And I feel like even once the actual kind of twist happens and Richard shoots Frank, we are still left to catch up, not in terms of what exactly is happening in the story right now, but the new question becomes, okay, that was an interesting story, where are we going now? Because yeah. we kind of put, just put an end to the story <laughs> that we were telling, you know? Yeah. It, it, it's still super intriguing at that point, and, and it's like a third of the movie only. <laughs> Yeah, we, we think at the beginning that we're going to follow the love story of these two people and the dynamics of being in a big age gap relationship. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they just cut us off that train, I guess. And they just guide us into the story of grief and marriage and parenthood. And it was interesting to, to witness. Mm -hmm. yeah. One last thing on the first act. It's fascinating to me that there's all these different sides. Both of the parents think differently of this relationship. The mother is more critical mm -hmm. and more afraid of if he plans to make that into a serious thing, while the dad is more open-minded towards it. You also have the perspective of Natalie, the actual woman in question, where she obviously likes him a lot. She loves that he is around. She loves that he is so good with their kids but she seems to be way more realistic about the fact that this giant age gap that this might not be for the future whilst frank is definitely dreaming at least a bit about them bringing up the kids together yeah it dreams a lot it dreams quite a bit but he also says he's dismissive when he's talking to his mother about the the subject right mm -hmm. he, yeah. he says oh no this is just a summer fling don't worry. Yeah, he claims it's nothing more. To his father, he's able to just pour his heart out and what intentions he has towards the relationship. There was an interesting, <laughs> not interesting, just funny uh, line that she said that they were like hanging out in the backyard and he was playing with blocks. And she says, oh, if you keep playing with the blocks, you know, I'm, I might feel like I'm <laughs> really <laughs> dating a young person. And then there comes this beautiful monologue about him explaining the architecture, the, the philosophy behind that architecture. Yeah. Uh, that was that was like a, a little instance where I already saw like, ah, yeah, that's definitely Todd Field being Todd Field about how it's the super obscure topic again. But this character is truly involved with it and just pours his heart into it. It just make, it makes it makes me happy, you know? <laughs> yeah. Uh, to, to finish up the the thought with the different perspectives on it, whilst all those people have different perspectives on the relationship, nobody means any harm. 
they are all just concerned for different reasons, but it's it's this general agreement of everybody involved wanting the best, just different yeah. philosophies of what that best is. Yeah, because they're not going to... Although the mother is controlling, she seems to not want to take a step further into, you know, probably breaking them off. Yeah. But that might be because the father is like pushing the other way. I don't know. Hmm. Since we're getting to the second act, I also think that the whole name of the movie in the bedroom isn't only about this triangle kind of thing. Of course, of course, yeah. One of the first thing we see in the second act, when uh, the act about griefing, I guess, is mm -hmm. the mother laying in the bedroom and kind of not reacting to anything, shutting herself in and just being by herself in the bedroom again. I love how just in this very tiny moment at the beginning of the second act, it instantly establishes that, okay, we're in a different in the bedroom now than we were like 30 minutes ago. Like a bedroom, it's just like, you know, it can be a, a safe place for you to have your most intimate moments or your biggest fights with your lover or, you know, you can just boil within mm -hmm. your sadness in the bed, you know? Yeah. And there's a lot of, of ways to see the bedroom, even yourself seeing the bedroom, you know? as a place of joy or deep sadness, comfort or intimacy. And I think that the movie goes a little bit through that. I don't think we see Natalie and Frank in a bedroom, but we know they've been in a bedroom, especially yeah. when the father comes home <laughs> yeah. from work and they're like, oh, weren't you supposed to be on the interview? Mm -hmm. And he goes like, oh, it was uh, postponed. Yeah. But you know, <laughs> she comes out of the bedroom, mm -hmm. you know, where they were having an intimate moment. So yeah, the bedroom is like as a character itself. It of. takes on multiple meanings throughout the film, yeah. definitely. I think one of the more interesting things about the second act is this idea that the act of violence not only forcefully ended one relationship, but also put its marks on other relationships surrounding it, like in particular, the relationship between his parents. At the beginning of the movie, we see how happy they really are. They are still obviously yeah. active in the bedroom, uh, implied by an earlier scene. And throughout the second act, they more and more drift apart up until a point where they totally explode and they scream stuff at each other that we know that they don't mean and they know that they don't mean, but the emotions are just boiling over at that point to a degree yeah. where if they wouldn't have had such a strong relationship to begin with, I think that whole incident might have split up them just as well, which I, I thought was, was a really interesting approach to the whole thing. Yeah. I love the Those... poker. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Oh, the you poker. Can, you can... Oh, what do you have to say about the poker? Because there, there was a, a nice moment there uh, yeah. with the, you know, so-called poet of the group yeah yeah i really liked it yeah yeah I, I wrote exactly that down so the in the second act probably my favorite moment was the poker scene the second poker scene where it's just the way he pauses intentionally and <laughs> kind of points out to his peers that they are behaving differently towards him it's kind of genius how he he says are you gonna let me stare at my cards forever? Yeah. Because in the earlier poker scene, they would have obviously had some banter and would have been jokingly pointed out to him that, hey, it's your turn. You should probably do something right now. But the way they interact with him post that incident is with such... Caution? Yeah, such caution to a degree where it really makes him uncomfortable that he just wants them to say something and they don't and the way it then gets broken up by the poet which we also already established in the first poker scene just almost as like a little side gag mm -hmm. the way that comes back and becomes all of a sudden this really serious moment between them oh my god that was very heartfelt yeah, yeah. the contrast then mm -hmm. again like just that as the contrast between you know the relationship 
of Ruth and Matt, right? Mm -hmm. they, so we have this happy couple in the in the beginning, and now they're like you know facing their problems and facing their grief. And yeah. in the same fashion, we have the poet guy that at first was you know joke and mock, but then the way that his poetry turns into something beautiful and useful for that moment because his friend his his friend needs it. I agree. It was a very interesting uh, transition mm -hmm. of the character mood, I guess, towards something. And then there's already the the split towards the third act that to me happens in the dialogue scene between the father and his lawyer. He like confronts him and at the restaurant asks if there's anything he can do. And the way it's directed with those super close ups of the lips, of the eyes, and then of just the pocket where he has his hand and fiddling mm -hmm. around with a key or with spare change or something like that. Uh, to me, it showed that the dad in that moment saw through the shallow statements that the lawyer was making, that anything the lawyer said in that specific scene was just to, you know, calm down the guy, get him to think about something else and just that he can move on with his day. But he wasn't really trying to get anywhere in the discussion. Yeah. He was already thinking about other things. He was fiddling around with whatever he could do, you know. Also, it might have might have been the turning point where, you know, he becomes a person that wants revenge. Yeah, um, he wants, definitely. He wanted revenge through the justice system. But at that point... He knew he wouldn't get it. He didn't, yeah, he knew mm -hmm. that, that justice was not going to be delivered. So he's going to take matters into his own, in his own hands. The, the big thing about the third act to me is... It's just this feeling of desperation. He feels like the only thing left to him to really achieve that feeling of justice has been served is the desperate attempt to serve it himself. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It starts off with like this dialogue scene in, in the bar where he's trying to get other people to speak up in court, which is like the first instance of him really taking matter into own hands, even though it is still within the justice system. Oh yeah, also the, the big fallout scene between him and his wife is just happening right around that time. So that's like a, a tipping point, another one. And yeah, then, then the whole ending happens, the whole abduction and <laughs> taking matters into, into your own hands. It's the, the way it turns out, it's really riveting. You're again in the shoes, I guess, of the beginning where you don't know no. his plan mm -hmm. and you are again left to catch up. You're almost in the shoes of Richard where you don't know where is this, where is this going. Is he really going to let him run? And Because initially that's what I assumed was going to happen is that he forcefully gets him to run away and by that forces upon a heavier punishment by the justice system because mm -hmm. he didn't comply yeah. to the Yeah, he's breaking things. the law. Yeah, yeah, he's breaking the law again. And him running would again imply that he maybe did more than just manslaughter, that it was actual murder. But then he mentions the cabin and, you know, his friend at the cabin mm -hmm. in the woods and that he's going to stay there for a while. And that made me suspicious right there. Yeah, there's, there's not that much more, I feel like, to be said about the ending itself. Mm -hmm. It's just really well executed. Again, almost shifting genres. So you could say the first act is a love story or a drama, I guess. Yeah. The second act <laughs> is partially court drama and partially just a, a drama a about of... griefing. Whilst the third act gets full-on thriller with almost horror elements to it. It's incredible to me how he balanced those out and did all of that just within his first feature. I mean, the, what a guy. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> the vibe reminded me a little bit of, um, I think it's Mystic River. Have you ever watched it? With oh, Sean I haven't. Fenn? I should, but oh. I haven't yet. Yeah, just... Yeah, you watch it. I'm gonna say I'm I'm not saying anything. <laughs> <laughs>
it's interesting that this father figure, Matt, he considers himself to be a reasonable person. And yeah. by the end, it's not <laughs> even reasonable by, you know, by the method or the plan that he has with his friend to kill this person because yeah. he killed him earlier than he was supposed to, you know? Mm -hmm. And he kills a person, which is an unreasonable thing to, to do. And I think that when he's in the bedroom and uh, Ruth is asking him, uh, you know, is everything okay? Did you do it? Blah, blah, blah. He keeps silent. I think he's within himself just judging. Judging his own himself, thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah taking Definitely. himself to court and judging his character because he just did an unthinkable thing because of a person that he loved. And also, he did it because he believed that the guy would get away with it, basically. Mm -hmm. So not, yeah. not in a direct manner, but still get off easily. And yeah. what we just witnessed is him committing murder in a way where he probably will completely get away with it. He's become the very thing. Also, yet again, this very last scene is fully taking place in the bedroom and it takes on a third final meaning of this regret almost of yeah. what what have I become? What has this thing driven me to do? Yeah. Fantastic. Fantastic little movie. What a debut. So scores. Are you ready for scores? I am ready for scores. I'm giving this an 8 out of 10. Big. I will give it a 6.5 out of 10. All right. All right. Which brings us, after a shorter discussion and a super long one, brings us to Amadeus. Amadeus. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I love this movie. 1984, Milos Forman, Amadeus, the somewhat fictionalized version of the story of Wolfgang Amadeus Mozart. What did yeah. you think of this? Should it be called Amadeus? Because the star here is Mr. Salieri. <laughs> I think it's a very interesting story about not only music, because, you know, that's the obvious. Mm -hmm. Anyone that might have like some passion for classical music or a passion for music in general will probably enjoy this movie a lot. It's very well constructed, very well written. The way that Salieri goes into monologues about God and music and intention and meaning, it's just very inspirational. The production overall, it's insane. The mm -hmm. costumes, oh my God, the, the wigs. <laughs> yeah. It's just a very colorful, diverse movie. Diverse in the sense of colors, <clears throat> not in the sense of ethnic backgrounds but which to be fair fits like the historical fits the, theme yeah, you know? what we think <laughs> that period. austria at the time was you know it has moments of comedy every time you know amadeus laughs that's a moment of comedy <laughs> in itself <laughs> but uh we also have the drama we have the tragedy and of course we have the music so it's just very well acted very you know very well performed and I, I really do enjoy this. It's very inspirational to me because it speaks to me on a musical level. And yeah, it's just amazing. Mm -hmm. What about you? What, you? what did you think? Yeah, this was, my, this was my second time around watching this movie. Oh yeah, same, same. I second basically everything you said of like a technical perspective. This movie is just masterful. It's so big. It's so grand in, in the energy it brings across in... The details it tackles so does people have analyzed all the scenes of piano playing in this movie and according to people who are way smarter with stuff like that than i am it's supposedly perfect there's not a single note in the playing you see that doesn't match up with the music you hear even to the degree where it, it's not really a spoiler that one party scene later on where he gets held oh, backwards, backwards yeah, yeah. yeah and he has to play backwards even that scene was done for real and <laughs> the actor played that and that was accurately played so <laughs> it's, it, it's kind of bonkers the way the the attention to detail in this movie there's barely any sets most of the giant 
<laughs> palaces in this movie are actually existing. A lot of them actually mm -hmm. in, in Czechia and not Austria, but... How do you feel? <laughs> <laughs> I I was surprised by that actually. I I was totally convinced. Yeah, that that all seems like Austrian palaces. That just looks like <laughs> the palaces look. The know. lies. <laughs> yeah, I I was successfully deceived. Even as an Austrian, it it just feels so right for the time period. Apparently, they did it because in Czechia you have less antennas and stuff like that mounted to the buildings. So, oh, so they okay. had to do less polishing up if they used Czechian locations that looked like Austrian locations. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that makes sense. Great movie, great performance. the The character of Amadeus himself is just perfectly tiptoeing his way around being too silly. So, for the story to really work. This character needs to be silly to a certain degree. It's a big problem of Salieri that, you know, a, a child almost like this would get all the talent that he asked God for, you know. It's a major concern of the movie, but at the same time, he can't get too over the top. And his laugh is really close to <laughs> sounding like something that Tommy Weiser would do in the room, you know. <laughs> it's, it's, it's really... It's borderline silly, but it works. And that's it that's works, such a yeah. nuanced thing to pull off. Huge respect to everyone involved in this movie. Even the the story perspective it took works really well. Since you pointed out, should it be called Amadeus? There's actually something I read. I don't know how accurate it is. Apparently Amadeus in Latin means something like, like God-given. Loved by God, Amadeus, yeah. Mm -hmm. it, it makes sense within the story when the major mm -hmm. theme is this idea of God gave us each our talents and that's what we have to work with. That this guy that has more talent that, than anyone would ever dream of would have that name. It's, it's kind of perfect. Yeah, his father, he was, I don't know, he manifested him. Yeah, he knew. <laughs> <laughs> he knew. <laughs> Yeah, do, can we go into a more spoilery talk? Let's do that. What did you think about Salieri? I would call him our main character. Yeah, what, he's definitely the him protagonist, that? yeah. Yeah? Yeah. What did you think about him? He's fascinating. He's, from like the first minute on, you have this talk with the priest and you instantly... <laughs> you instantly get to experience his thriving for a legacy. So there's this thing where the priest says, I can't leave, your, uh, leave a soul in pain. And mm -hmm. Salieri says, do you know who I am? With, which gave the implication to the priest that uh, he might feel sorrow, as in like, yeah, my soul does deserve the pain that I have. You know, you don't know the things I've done, you know, that kind of way of mm -hmm. yeah. do you know who I am? When in actuality, as we find out just a few seconds later, the whole do you know who I am is a very egotistical drive for this legacy, followed up by this perfect example of this, of him playing two little tunes that he wrote, followed up by one of the melodies of Zauberflöte, the last opera Mozart did. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, which he instantly recognizes, obviously. It's instantly established that this character is someone whose main focus is that drive, that aiming for being the one to be remembered. And I think it's yeah. a fascinating side to tackle the story from. I looked it up afterwards as to how much of the story is actually real, how much was interpreted, how much was totally made up. and. The part that is real is that they were both composing in Vienna, Salieri was the one with the success, and Mozart was always thriving for Freelancing. a position yeah. like Salieri had. One can assume that Salieri was probably aware that Mozart is the better composer. You know, he's, he's a man of the arts, he knows what he's doing. He probably knew that talent that was in Mozart, but there's no real reason to assume that Salieri was actually 
jealous of Mozart in any way, because he was up until the end the successful one of them. And he also had the, the whole part where he knows of his legacy is just, it's more of the way how in Tar we said earlier that you could interpret it with the knowledge of, of the retrospective. We know that Salieri won't be remembered by history. He didn't back then. But writing the character in a way where what if he knew about that is a really interesting approach. Yeah. Salieri, to me, I think is just the devotion to music as an art and the reincarnation of jealousy itself in someone, you know? It's just the personification of jealousy or envy, because when you're faced with talent as big as Mozart had, mm -hmm. it's very conflicting, right? I love to witness people performing music and being able to create music that is better than mine, you know? But mm -hmm. there's some so effortlessly good at what they're doing that it's, it also invokes a kind of envy for that that I cannot have. Yeah. First example that comes to mind is, for example, uh, Jacob Collier, okay? It's insufferable. <laughs> <laughs> I love him, like his ability to do the things that he does, but it gets to a point that it's just annoying how good it is, you know? And I think that Salieri sees that in Mozart as well, apart from, you know, the whole Mozart, because, you know, he was a, a child star right? Since he was three or four, he was performing at the most prestigious courts in Europe. He was doing performances that, you know, your average pianist or even the most renowned pianist couldn't even imagine. Mm -hmm. And he was just four. So he was a party trick, you know, he was a performer since he was young. And he probably didn't have time to enact his childhood and being a child and being childish and in that way i think that the person that we see now now this was like a 28 or 29 year old uh mozart no it was not he died at 34 right so yeah i, th I think so. that still adds up somewhat yeah because it spans multiple years mm -hmm. but we now see this person an adult that is trying to still chase that childhood and still has that spark that many of us have lost of being that pure, now is not so innocent, right? But uh, being pure, uh, childish and very annoying. And Salieri cannot deal with that, with the fact that such a childish person could like bear such talent, right? And that's very interesting, but at the same time, is very devoted to whatever Mozart produces, you know? Yeah. His disbelief towards the vessel that God shows doesn't block him from appreciating the music that he produces, the music that he creates, because he believes that God is using him and what a beautiful use is putting to him. Mm -hmm. um, while he's very envious, for sure, I think that there's a a clear worship of Mozart and his art. Definitely, yeah. I also like that in the first 10 minutes, we establish two things, or like, we establish one thing and address one thing. As you already pointed out, Mozart, as a child, must have been some sort of party trick, where... He probably had no childhood. And the movie addresses that pretty much instantly. He recalls a memory of his own childhood, talking to his dad that he would love to be like Mozart. And he just says something like, oh, so you want to be a trained monkey? Yeah. Which instantly shows that other perspective of it, where, yeah, he probably was at, his, at the time the equivalent of the overbearing parent really wants him to succeed and takes away all their childhood, you know? Yeah. And the other thing that we instantly address within the first minutes, basically right after that, is that Salieri is somewhat of a psychopath. 
yeah, <laughs> at least in, in this story, <laughs> by giving us that moment where he prays to God to make his dream come true, to to be a voice for the music that God wants to play, to to worship God. And then his father dies and he's like, hell yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I think it plays into the way that, you know, religious people and God worshiping people often, you know, interpret their love for God. You mm -hmm. know, when he was telling his story about when he, you know, he, he was in Italy, he was a small uh, child and his dad was not too keen into the whole music thing. And the only way that he could experience uh, music was in church. And I could relate to that so much. Most classical music, I don't want to say all, but a lot of it is very, it's very religious. It's very, yeah. you know, plays with a lot of religious themes. And while I'm not religious, I always thought that church music is something like music about God, the way that we write about god and you know the the glory and a higher self in a way if you want to you know instead of putting this through a perspective of a god being entity whatever mm -hmm. we can just like think of us as higher selves i always thought that that music that tries to invoke that type of feeling it's so you know exalting just very fulfilling and I had the same thought as Salieri in the, this movie because when I was in church, the the main thing that I was noticing was you know the choir, the the organ, uh, the violin. I was just awed by the fact that someone could write something that could fill up a room and just move people in a way. So that was a very you know relatable point um, to me. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And he said something interesting while he was talking about himself and the way, you know, he made his way into Vienna. Yeah. He said, I liked myself until he came. <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, oh boy, here we go. <laughs> yeah, it plays into the insecurities he probably feels. He sacrificed a lot, you know. He had a, a hard time building up himself to be a court composer and uh, be in that position from where he started from. And Mozart just, it looks like he got things easier, right? It all comes easy to him. Salieri has to ask God for inspiration so he can literally put a note on a sheet of paper. Yeah. So that plays into the, the envy as well, right? Yeah, for sure. I feel like it plays into it that Salieri devoted his life kind of to this. A big part of his whole regret throughout this is that he didn't touch women. He he didn't mm -hmm. live his life truly because he felt like he owed it to God to give back what he enabled through the death of his father. Yeah. He swore himself to God and to the music and to worship God with his music. And that is all he ever does. And there's this guy, this young guy that not only is way better at exactly that, what he truly wants and desperately tries to do, but he also just doesn't seem to devote anything to that. You know, yeah. he just shows up and does those things, but he also does all the supposedly morally bad things of the time you know and still yeah. there's no punishment by god for that you know mm -hmm. so i think a lot of envy also stems from that side of the of the coin and while salieri is very strict and religious about the way that he sees you know music mozart is not right he presents this piece for the i mean he doesn't present salieri puts his nose where it, it doesn't belong and leaks to the emperor that Mozart is writing this opera in German, right? It's in German and it's in a brothel and whatever. And uh, no, no, uh, the, the first thing is written in German, but they agreed about upon that and they knew it would be in the brothel. Um, the, the big the controversy. New? Yeah. Yeah. The big controversy is the second piece where he's writing about 
he's basically adapting a theater piece that was banned off the stage by the emperor, but he's adapting it into an opera. So that was the, the controversy about that one. Oh, he banned the marriage of Figaro. Yeah, yeah, genau. Exactly. That's the one he is, he is, is writing, the yeah. opera, right? Yeah. But he talks about, he gives the idea to the emperor about an opera about a brothel, right? Mm -hmm. But that's not, whatever. I just got <laughs> confused about what was exposed and what was not exposed, right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, but so he wants to compose an opera about a brothel. And people just think that, you know, music shouldn't be about such crude subjects. Yeah. They even consider German too dirty, not dirty, but too brute for, for singing. They're very, <laughs> very, yeah, they try to be very clean and very traditional about the way that they face the music. While Mozart is more willing to freeform the thing and just go with the flow and be more open-minded towards what music means and what it uh, can be. And Salieri can, can't really do that, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Salieri always conforms to the structures in place while Mozart is really trying to be bold and to break out yeah. of the restraints. Yeah. Regarding that topic, there's a lot of parallels to be drawn from the story to the movie industry, which probably served as some point where Foreman could apply his own life to the whole thing, where he could draw inspiration from. Because when Amadeus gets confronted with those regulations, with the idea of, yeah, you can't have a ballad in your play because the emperor forbid that, it's almost as if a studio boss would come mm -hmm. up to the director and tell him, yeah, no, we can't have like a sex scene right there. You know, we gotta be yeah. PG-13, whatever. They can't say that. They can't. We have sponsors. The film is too long. Yeah, the film is too long. Whatever. You know, some influence by the studio bosses and trying to limit the creative vision of the author, if you want to call it that, which really in those cases is Mozart. Yeah, I guess it's really the business, you know, even in music, it's still business, right? Mm -hmm. On a related note, one could make the argument that Foreman is a somewhat forgotten master of his time with this and One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest and Man on the Moon. He made several really impactful big movies of the 20th century. Yet when it comes to discussing the important or influential directors of the time, Milos Foreman probably never comes up, if, if we're mm. honest. So he's... He's to a degree, I can see parts of Milos Forman both in Mozart and in Salieri, Salieri which is really interesting and probably yeah. a reason why both of them get developed so well. He probably saw parts of himself in both of them. In a way, it's funny, right, that he deals with these themes of uh, being forgotten and legacy and... It's not like his legacy was forgotten, but his name is not one that uh, most people remember. Yeah, right? that, that instantly comes to mind in discussions, yeah. Yeah. Again, something like that happens when Figaro gets pulled off the opera, despite like the, the expert opinion, in this case um, Salieri, thinking that the, the play was fantastic, but the emperor's opinion, which had that one yawn, you know, Mm -hmm. Too many notes. <laughs> yeah, too many notes, the, which represents the general audiences, I guess. Therefore, it only got nine performances. There isn't even missed that line. If the general audiences don't like it, one has to accept that. And the line, the emperor can keep his attention for one hour, you gave him four. Yeah. You could you could draw those exact comparisons to like critic darlings versus general film audiences and attention yeah. spans with longer movies. And in the same dialogue, Salieri even also not only takes on the perspective of a critic, but also of the other side. He embodies kind of both, where he is also the, the blockbuster filmmaker, if you want to call it that, where he says, mm -hmm. I think you overestimated the Viennese, my friend, didn't even give them a big bang at the end of the tune bang so they him. know when to clap. <laughs> you could easily, yeah. easily see that very same sentence being made 
when you talk about indie films compared to an MCU film where at the end you have that big fight scene, you know, where people know what to expect and that's the end of it. Now big fight scene and now we can clap. It's it's so fascinating to me how yeah, many or, parallels mm -hmm. to filmmaking there are in there. Or even with music itself, you know, if you're not playing a sad song, how do I know that it's supposed to be a sad scene? Yeah. Um, <laughs> very interesting. I didn't even go that far with uh, with it, but yeah, it's for sure. Concerning that opera, and concerning the the relationship between Mozart and Salieri, mm -hmm. the the relationship that Mozart knows that yeah. Salieri is his pal, you know, there's that moment where Salieri, you know, is talking about his opera and that it was good, but. And then we cut to Salieri's own opera, mm -hmm. and he's getting compliments left and right. The emperor is like, "Oh yeah, it's so good." The best opera, best written opera yet. ever written mm -hmm. yet. Mm, <laughs> yum. We see that Salieri is not fully satisfied with that. You know, with those opinions, he's looking for Mozart's opinions. Exactly. Yeah. Because it's the only opinion that really matters to him. The it opinion really matters, of yeah. the one guy who knows more about music than himself. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And Mozart just gives him empty compliments, right? Because mm -hmm. he knows that Salieri is not really doing anything extraordinary. Yeah. So One can only say, call it Salieri. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I think that after that scene... He receives the news of his father's death. Yeah. Which yeah. is also a note I wrote down about that. It's this fantastic showcase of real life influences affecting the art an artist creates. We get that information that Leopold Mozart died. And mm -hmm. we don't really get to see any direct grief by Mozart. We don't get... A reaction even by him we instantly cut to his next completed opera and the breaking out of the evil character in that i'm, I'm not sure <laughs> what exactly he he literally meant but and salieri explaining to uh, the priest or i guess the audience to us that this was the darkest thing mozart ever wrote mm, really? that this was really how he worked through that pain and i think it's awesome that yes on one hand it almost serves this music biopic cliche of rushing through big life events but yeah. in showing us the music with this context we kind of get to feel the pain in the way mozart himself expressed it like that's that's the way he got over it. That's the yeah. way he worked through that pain. And we get to see the final result. That, like, this opera is his therapy. This was how he overcame those issues, you know? You think he, I don't think he got over the pain, though. I think he was, it was the way that he was, you know, expressing himself. And the way that he saw his relationship with his father, for sure. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, getting over it was maybe... Too far. Yeah, because yeah. because it's the first time that we see, or the first moment that we see the broken Mozart, right? Mm -hmm. It's just like sweating and it's all over the place. And from that moment on, it's downhill. Mm -hmm. Towards the end of the movie, we have that whole thing where Mozart writes an opera for, I guess, the equivalent of Off Broadway, where he's not really getting any work in in mm -hmm. the big prestigious opera anymore and he is turning to this more for the general audience's side of of theater of opera and that's where for money he writes the his equivalent of mainstream pop i guess <laughs> the zauberflöte here's the really interesting thing i thought about it there growing up as an austrian you're almost certainly confronted with a little bit of Mozart at some point. So in primary school, I had this experience where a touring theater group kind of, they had, they had a stop at, at our school and 
the whole school gathered in the gym and they had played the Zauberflöte. And a lot of people in my age experienced something similar to that, where that's the one opera pretty much every Austrian has, at least as a kid, seen at some point of Mozart. And it's this really ironic thing where it's the one piece he probably isn't that proud about. It's the one piece he wrote out of desperation for money and out of desperation that he wouldn't get anything else anymore. And then it made me think about the beginning again. Because the one tune the pastor recognizes is of the Zauberflöte. So mm -hmm. even if you would replace the first two tunes by other melodies by Mozart, the chances are the scene would play out the whole same thing. It's just a different perspective. But if Mozart was sitting there and playing older melodies of which he is more proud of, he would also probably haven't have recognized it. And the instance he plays Zauberflöte, the pastor would have realized it and Mozart would have been just as disgusted with like the fact that that's the his legacy, that's... Mm -hmm. you know? So it's... Yeah, that's interesting. I, I thought that was a really fascinating whole ordeal to this thing where... He, Salieri couldn't see that Mozart also doesn't have the legacy he was probably aiming for. Or <laughs> Salieri just played that one as the most silly one and the, you know, the one that is recognized. <laughs> <laughs> to mock <laughs> <You know>? him. <laughs> <laughs> just to mock him. One yeah. less laugh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, interesting. One thing about that theater of the people sequence is that, you know, Mozart in opposite to Salieri, as I said before, is more free thinking, you know, more open minded. Mm -hmm. And even if the people are mocking his work, he's still like having a lot of fun with it. And, and he loves to see people having fun. Mm -hmm. uh, and one thing that was interesting, it's the languages that are used throughout. So in this common theater, we have English, right? They are mostly speaking English in the yeah, the theater pieces. true. And not Italian or German, because, you know, English is our language. So that play was also for us, in a way, not only the public, because if it was in German, we probably wouldn't, you know, know uh, the things. I don't know. Just interesting. It doesn't really make sense out of a literal in universe thing, because, you know, mm -hmm. it, it, yeah, it yeah. plays yeah, in a course. German country. But in movie universe, it makes sense as in. English is the common ground everyone can unite yeah. on. I didn't realize, but you're, you're totally right. I guess that brings us to the final dictating sequence. It's the dictation and also the sight reading by Salieri. In the first moments of the movie, uh, when the wife, Constanza, brings Mozart's work because she wants him to apply to this position of tutorage mm -hmm. and He's reading, sight reading the music, and it's just like <laughs> I was listening to it. And if I listen to the music without the context of the movie, and without having Salieri's reaction, I would probably not think a lot about it. But when you sit with it, and there's like someone, as you said, with passion, just you know, exposing it to you, you can't help but feel like you're listening to something as mm -hmm. good as they're telling you. The director and the writer of the play, uh, Peter Schaefer, they have a way of just making you feel like this is probably a song that you can like, you know, it's like mm -hmm. something that you can like if you really listen to it. The fact that it, ha it had no corrections, no uh, mistakes, like yeah. every note was a final decision, very intentional. It really just speaks into the whole miraculous process of writing. Uh, that Mozart has, because, you know, he's the voice of God. And yeah. we see that in the dictation scene. Mm -hmm. What a lovely scene. True. The way sure. they find each other and find respect in each other, but you also see the differences where he can't keep up with the speed in which Mozart thinks of music. Mm -hmm. It perfectly shows their differences, but also their common ground in that scene such a, a lovely culmination of, of their characters' arcs, of their relationship. Yeah. 
for sure. We saw some parts of uh, Salieri just being appreciative of the music when it's like, you know, feeling emotional towards it or reacting, just moving his body or letting a tear fall. We see this here and mm -hmm. we don't see any envy or vengeful, you know, vengeance in his eyes. He, he seems like he's devoted, he's passionate. At that moment, he's like a, a pupil to the voice of God. Right, yeah. he's worshiping. He's just inspired by you know the the moment. He's doing all he can to help what he believes is the fulfilling the wish of God that this music will be created. Yeah. yeah, yeah, he's in the process in that moment, right? Mm -hmm. Because what we're witnessing, it's just the conversion of you know genius into paper. Like we're seeing the building blocks of uh, beauty. And, you know, it's shown to us, it's, we can hear it, and it's just very, I don't know, it's just, ah, I love it mm -hmm. so much. It, I think it's one of the greatest, like, musical scenes. It's like up there. Um, yeah, definitely. It just twinkles something in me. This has to be put into the context that, so Salieri is writing this piece for Mozart, that it's going to be his revenge, you know, towards mm -hmm. God. Because yeah. Salieri is going to steal this piece and then he's going to play at the funeral. Taking credit of, for the genius, yeah. Yeah. But there's a moment where he says to Mozart that he's not leaving him. And you wonder that maybe, just maybe, Salieri might care for him and not just this music. Mm -hmm. It's like the devotion is turned from... It's the devotion towards the vessel of God and not just the voice. And it's just a very touching moment because there we see just a glimpse of, of good in Salieri because up until this point, he's very self-centered and, you know, very manipulative and greedy, I would say as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we have that moment where they're finishing Lacrimos, I think. Um, and for, I think that this symphony... It's not a symphony. It's a opera. Yeah, the, the the death mass. Yeah, it's not finished. Like in real life, Mozart wasn't able to finish this piece. He died. Here we get the same thing. We they finish like Rimosa, but they don't finish the piece overall because he dies before the deed. I just have one more note, which is a little trivia thing surrounding that sequence. Mm -hmm. Which really points out the little tricks used to effectively portray complex emotions on screen. The actor Tom Hughes, who played uh, Mozart, mm -hmm. when filming that scene, he constantly skipped lines and jumped around between different points of that discussion in order to rip out the other actor who played Salieri and force him almost to... <laughs> play it as if he can't keep up, you know? That whole feeling yeah. of him not being able to keep up with the crazy fast ticking <laughs> mind of Mozart was just achieved by the guy who plays Mozart <laughs> just skipping Damn, lines and I don't know. constantly confusing his peer. Yeah, <laughs> that's kind of amazing. It's interesting. Yeah. That's an interesting technique. Such a lovely thing. I have to say that the funeral in itself, right? Mm -hmm. We have this important moment where Mozart is buried in a common grave. His genius mm -hmm. doesn't take him into a mausoleum. He's not like being worshipped mm -hmm. for the talent that he has. He's buried just as any man. I think in the beginning of the movie, I think the father says that all men are equal in God's eyes. Mm -hmm. And yeah. Salieri like questions that because he knows, like he met Mozart and in his eyes, you know, Mozart is more than like, you know, because of the talent that he has, most people didn't see him that way at the time, right? Like mm -hmm. he was buried just like anyone else. And yet, even if he's, you know, buried in a common grave, he was eternal, as Salieri said. He sa Salieri, I think he calls himself the king of mediocrity or the yeah. god of mediocrity, right? He thought that, you know, he has laughed at God. He threw the, the last joke at God and at Mozart. 
But <laughs> what's funny and the ending uh, shot of the scene, we just hear this <laughs> annoying laugh by Mozart, you know, like, <laughs> as if God is mocking him because yeah. he's still being haunted by the talent of this person that now is eternal and he is forgotten. Yeah. Yeah. Fantastic. Scores. <laughs> <laughs> Scores. I'm yeah. giving Amadeus uh, 8 out of 10. I give it a 10 out of 10. Awesome. And with that, we end this discussion. Next episode, for the first time in this podcast, we won't be discussing any current movie. We will be watching Risk Cutters, a 2006 movie directed by Goran Dukic, about a love story in the afterlife, starring Patrick Fujit, Shannon Sossamon, and Shia Wigham. The second movie we are going to discuss is the directorial debut of Dave McCrary, Brixby Bear. Released in 2017, Brixby Bear is a uniquely weird little film that showcases a love for nostalgia and filmmaking whilst working through some intense themes with an almost odd positivity. Instead of the usual third movie, we're gonna have our first guest in the next episode and spend the remaining time on going through our list of questions with him. If you don't want to get spoiled for these two lovely movies, check them out by the next episode as we were George, Bia, and we were two euros per movie. <laughs>